you so much, Nancy. Okay, recording the process. So, uh, uh, Aaron and I were, were fortunate enough a couple of weeks ago to sit down with Jorge and uh, Manish and, and discuss what you're about to hear now. And, and it was exciting, and I'm really uh, looking forward to having them share uh, this, this exciting uh, in a sort of uh, initiative that are taken with, in their classrooms with the rest of the faculty members. So without delay, I wanted to, well, let's start off with, with Jorge. Jorge, uh, what prompted you to incorporate career content into your curriculum and why was this important for you? Yeah, well, um, I, had, um, I had other engagements prior to coming to Yukon and uh, I had started incorporating it early on as first uh, some experiments and uh, I turned out quite successful although I had to wait a few years until those experiments came to fruition as I started hearing um, from students who had gone through the program and then had contacted me after that like hey you know that lecture and that mock interview that you did with us worked out great um, so that's one thing, and then obviously, well, in industrial design as well, it's, it's one of the different facets of being a designer, being an industrial designer, but we cultivate having a portfolio early on in the career, first year students. And um, one thing is to say to a potential employer where you're coming from, where you studied, but then they, the next question they will ask is, okay, can you show me some samples of your work? So it is ingrained in, in, at least in our profession, and uh, to me it was second nature. And once I saw that there was the opportunity through the Center for Career Development, I kind of jumped in. So we have it early on. Um, the ultimate goal, why I want to do this, is obviously so that students will have a seamless transition from being students to being professionals. I think that's one of the most important world. Um, um, references that we can give them, you know, how they can navigate through that. And the only thing they, in my opinion, the best way to do it would be through practice early on, not just in the, one of the last minute things would be, oh, before you graduate, let's do this thing last minute. I don't think it would work that well. It has to start early. That's a great point, Jorge. Manish, what about you? Yes, so um, actually I do love interacting with my students uh, inside and outside the classroom. And from the discussions, like several discussions that I had with them. So I figured like I normally get two types of students. One type, they know everything. They know, and it's a good thing. They know what they are gonna do post-graduation. They know what and where are the resources available. And then the other type, they vaguely know that they will do some kind of job post-graduation, but they don't know what are the resources available. For example, uh, one of my advisees a couple of years back, uh, they didn't know the existence of Center for Career Development at UConn and what resources we offer. Uh, so for me, it comes naturally that uh, if we talk about career in inside and outside the classroom, that will probably give a level field to all the students. And another reason is very personal. Like nobody in my family went for graduate school. And for example, when I was a grad, uh, I was an undergrad student. I didn't know about GRE, the graduate records examination that you need to take to get some scholarship uh, in the US or Canada. So there is a personal reason for me as well that, okay, if I do talk about this stuff, maybe some students will benefit of it. Okay, thank you so much, Manish and Jorge. Now you answered the why, uh, let's talk about the how. So if you could each give me, give us a couple of examples of how you went about uh, incorporating career content within your curriculum. And let's start with Manish this time. So as I mentioned before that I teach uh, engineering 1166, which is a very foundation level engineering course in the School of Engineering, as well as I teach some upper level courses, for example, senior design and other technical courses. 
So in 1166, so we started doing a project portfolio thing that uh, I think Hore will speak about that. And also uh, this year, this past semester, what I did that I had one of my senior students come to my class and then that student presented about the fundamentals of engineering exam, which is a stepping stone to get the professional licensure in the field of civil engineering, which is very important, especially for students who would like to go to the industry. It's like kind of must thing. So I thought maybe I could uh, have students listen to that, that uh, senior student talk about this stuff. And for senior design, so I am one of the instructors. So we are a team of six to seven instructors. So we have a dedicated module on career readiness in our course. So in that module, we have several resources. For example, how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, uh, like do's and don'ts to give like interviews. And we also have several interviews, like recorded interviews with our alumni. So the students actually can browse through all those resources and get themselves prepared for their interviews, for their job application. And also we have like a sim simulated exercise. So um, we, in our, in our program, we normally get like 20 to 30 projects. And we have probably 80 civil engineering students. And if I consider ENV students, maybe another uh, 35 or 40 so. So we ask the students that they should apply for their uh, favorite project. It's not that we are going to give you the project. It's like you have to apply for the project. So what they do as part of the process, they submit cover letter, they submit resume. And then they actually appear for interviews with the faculty members. And then, uh, so the idea is they have to uh, sell their skills, their experience to us. And based on the interview and based on the application package, we allocate the projects to them. So it's basically a simulated experience for them mm -hmm. that they can expect uh, right before or right after they graduate. And I suppose and, that really helps them engage in this exercise since you, you, you're framing it in the specific way that you're framing it. Yes, that's what we intend to do. That mm -hmm. it's, it's very practical. Uh, and the interview, at least the, the way I do it, it's that it's based on my experience with giving interviews in, in industry sector. Yes, mm -hmm. so it's definitely, uh, I think it's very helpful. Okay, thank you so much, Manish. Jorge? Um, yeah, uh, I... I take a slightly different approach, a bit less structured, but kind of more granular. Um, I try to, in all the lectures, embed uh, as much as possible, you know, my professional expertise. It's around 10 years of uh, being a designer. Um, in fact, after becoming a teacher, I realized that I always had wanted to be a teacher. And I had jumped from professional job as a designer to different jobs. Um, with the intention of, of gathering the experience and then kind of moving along. Um, so whenever I have the chance, I talk to the students on the daily lectures and exercises about all that gather experience. Like, hey, it's almost like telling them the, 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 the little stories about one's life. But once you bring it to a personal level, I think they, they appreciate that more. And I know in our audience, we have some students, I mean, some faculty that might not have that professional experience, but, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so embedding that in the lectures, I think it's very important. Um, and I have tried several things and I mix and match so that I try to avoid getting the, the students always the same recipe, just to keep it a bit more active. But for example, I would do a video lecture myself, but if they would just hear my voice and then I would record my hands doing a sketch or doing something and then I would upload it. 
sometimes I would just bring and do a recording of my own drawings that I would have done in the past for a particular client. And um, I would talk about them and do the recording and uploading. Um, some of the times I bring, it happened this semester, I happened to be interviewed by um, a former student of mine. He opened up a uh, on Spotify a, um, a series of lectures. He interviews professionals. And he had contacted me, I think it was like, I was the second or third after he had opened up this, this service. And uh, I said, sure, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> and then half through the project, I felt validated because we were doing something in my class that he had done professionally for this particular company. And he mentioned it. So I told the students, hey, uh, there is this interview, it happened to be me that ga I gave the interview, but the interesting thing is that you guys see the project that we are doing in class, they are doing it in industry in the same manner. So it's kind of cool to see that you're hearing from someone else rather than me, because he's saying, you know, the interviewer is saying, oh, Jorge, you're saying this, I did that uh, in this company. So that's one thing. And um, I have tried as well, um, inviting professional organizations this semester, for example, it had to be off hours though, because it didn't coincide exactly with our meeting hours. So I didn't, I couldn't make it mandatory. It was a conference in design, but for women, uh, women in design, the roles of the recent roles that women have played in, in designing different instruments and gadgets and stuff. So, um, and of course, male and female students came. So that was another way. These were professionals talking about what they do day in and day out. Um, and uh, I had, the interesting about this is that I had, I knew the organizer of the event and I, I would take pictures of our classroom uh, at the Krenike Institute and I, and I would mail it to him. And then he would email me pictures of the conference in Cincinnati. And then I would show our students as the presenters were presenting. So it was, I was trying to make it more kind of interactive. Um, and it was super fun. Um, of course, you can always invite professional lecturers, um, people in the industry to give a lecture if they can give the time exactly when you give the, when you detect the conference in the classroom. Um, and it happened once actually um, in my class that it happened to coincide exactly the day and the hour when I was teaching that class. And I joined in and the students were able to listen to all that. It was an hour and, and, an hour and a half with the Q&A. So we just uh, listened to the first half hour so we could cover all the things. But at least they got the opportunity again to, to hear professionals talking about this topic that fit, fit exactly with what we needed to talk that day. And then um, Manish and I will talk more as these questions would go. Um, the portfolio of work we have introduced in, in engineering the notion that students should prepare a narrative, a portfolio of work mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. um, and what they need to do is, they don't have to do it perfect, but at least they need to start creating a guess, a narrative of what they are doing. One thing is doing the work for a grade, and then that's it. And a very different thing is to prepare the work so that they are ready to be in front of an audience and, and be poised and be like, hey, here I am. This is me individually, or this is me and I am part of a team and they introduce everybody and they have their poster and the whole thing. So it's a different story. Um, but we gave them freedom to, so that they arrange all their work. And one of the first lessons that they, that they receive is that less is more. Um, to paraphrase Adolf Floss, it's an architect, um, long time deceased in, uh, in, um, um, from Austria. You don't have to say everything in design. You only have to say what's really important and leave the rest outside. So many students try to jam everything in. And then what you're doing is kind of mucking, you know, what it's important. Sometimes you only need to hit just a very few points. Um, yeah, practicing is super important here. Um, you need to give them the, the students the opportunity to to really craft that part that they haven't developed. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing uh, here from you, both you and Manish is that there's no one right way of doing this, and sometimes you have to show some creativity, 
in order to have students engage and have their own sort of get their own creative juices going uh, and, and seeing you know, that, that, that there's, a, there's an actual, there's a light at the end of the tunnel here that I'm doing something which is, doesn't necessarily have to be something boring. It could be something fun. It could be something engaging. So I also want to move on to talk about the potential challenges that you have faced along the way. Uh, one of them, of course, being that you as faculty members already have a lot on your plates but that's just one area that we wanted to explore is how you were able to uh, engage in effective time management. What, what were some of the shortcuts you were able to take in order to integrate this career content without adding too much to your workload, but also any of the other potential challenges that come to mind while trying to implement these, these initiatives. And uh, Manish? Yeah, Theo, I think you answered this question on behalf of me. Is it time? The biggest challenge is the time because this is something we are trying to do extra, like go above and beyond of our course content and lectures and exam, taking exams, right? So, um, so definitely time is a big challenge. So for example, for senior design, and uh, just to be, I'm clear that senior, whatever I'm talking about senior design is not my own, it's not just me. So we are like six, seven faculty members, we do this collectively. And so for senior design, uh, when we had to pivot to online in 2020, so what we did, we, um, we revamped our that module application, job application module, and it was time consuming. So, but fortunately the School of Engineering and our department, they provided us with some good support. So we had one, I believe one or two grad students who worked with us during that summer, and they actually helped us prepare that module. And for my individual effort, uh, I still don't know the answer how to how to navigate this without spending too much time. So I do spend a lot of time, but I these days what I do is I try to instead of talking about all these for an entire session, I try to uh, sneak in. Uh, like if I'm say teaching some soil mechanics and if something comes up and then I talk about uh, what they do the, as a practicing engineers, what they are expected to, expected to do or what I did when I was a civil engineer on site. But yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, no it's okay. Jorge? Uh, yeah, one of the challenges, I'll, I'll bring the, I'll answer the topic in a different way, comes just on the personal level. Some students don't have that experience of first, um, you know, what career, what they want to do as a career professional, you know, when they graduate. And um, they have to start with a, a level or even sub level, and it's practice. Um, so sometimes, obviously you have the peer pressure. Um, sometimes classes might not be very big, but some of the times they are loaded, you know, 25 students or more, or if it is a lecture class, you know, it's a lot of students and you need then to change hats. And one thing is content, another thing is being the entertainer, right? I'm not saying that we wouldn't have to tap dance in front of them, but basically alleviate the pressure of, of, of having always them to, to be on the stage. If you put the, a student on the stage without really warning them, they're gonna freeze. Just very few will have the really the poise to say something in front, in front of everybody. So I encourage them to practice presenting in public and practice presenting their work, whether it is orally or with the, uh, with the help of some graphics and um, presenting you know, some sort of a continuation from beginning to end how their project went. In one of the lectures that we had in 1166 in engineering, 1166, this is the, uh, one of the beginning classes in engineering we had, I gave them a lecture on this topic and I told, I, instead of talking about engineering, I told, I, the, the short lecture was about movie posters and how they are trying to convey a lot of information with just the minimum, the bare elements. And then we were talking about the principles of design in this case, what's composition, what's balance, what's um, contrast, and, and then a few others. And then they have kind of a sense. And then 
this was a short lecture, but in a different type of setting, I would tell them, okay, so now let's practice and we switch roles. And then humor is very important here too, to kind of break the ice. Sometimes I would, I would ask them to sit in circle, remove all the chairs and everything. And I'd say, now we change roles. Now I am going to be the interviewee and one of you guys would be the interviewer. And uh, I bring mock business cards, just blank pieces of paper. And then I first do what not to do. So I try to find the business card as I try to shake their hands. And this was pre-COVID, you know, when I tried this, of course, and now it would be different. But uh, uh, wait a minute, I can't find the card. And then it's just this awkward moment and the students laugh. And I'm like, okay, now let's switch. And some other times I bring a portfolio and then I put it on the table that I put in the center of that circle. But I put the portfolio in reverse as if I was reading it, but not the interviewer. And then I would lean over the interviewer, kind of hovering over their neck and being like, okay, what did you write over here? And it's awkward, of course, because you're invading their personal space. And then the students laugh again about it. And then I say, okay, let's stop the role play. What did you guys learn about this? What happened here? Some other times I, it tends to happen better when we have a classroom with a, with a blackboard um, or dry erase board. And then I ask the students, okay, this is what we're going to do here. Instead of me just giving you the prompts of what's going to happen, let's find some learning outcomes here. We're going to practice with mock interviews and everything that happens. If I was gonna write a, a, um, a rubric, what would be the main points that we would need to cover? And then, so they become the judges as well. They have to decide the ones that are most or less least important. If this is the very first class and the students are super shy, I bring a deck of uh, post-its and then write on post-its. And then we put them in different categories. And then I start, okay, let's, let's um, consolidate all of these into these few categories and then let's organize them. What do you guys think? And then I always involve them. And then it becomes a lot more um, fun, but they still get the information. And then I'll just say one more thing. Another challenge is many students come to the school with this idea that they have to excel. And instead of really learning what they need to learn, they are focused on the, the grade point average and that percentage, right? And it's in their minds all the time. And um, sometimes, you know, giving the option of saying, okay, you can resubmit um, whenever you want, or give them, let's say you can resubmit two times, or it kind of alleviate, relieves all that pressure. And that's when they really start to doing better jobs because they are focusing on the content, not so much on that final number. Mm -hmm. uh, Manish previously said that uh, he sees no way around it. He's gonna to have to spend some extra time. And I know that Manish enjoys doing that, basically working and, and talking to students, even outside the classroom, spending, what is it, Manish, you told me the other day, it's a 20 minute meeting and it turns out to a one hour meeting because we enjoy uh, advising students. But uh, I want to come back to you, Jorge, in terms of time management, where, when you really have a lot on your plate, what can you do to, uh, to make sure that that wor additional workload uh, isn't going to really impact your, your, your daily routine? Uh, is, for example, mm -hmm. empowering students one way of going about it so they're doing most of the legwork while you're sort of coordinating what would you recommend yes yeah, certainly that's one thing um another thing it's actually more work and obviously less time for me would be to i've tried it and it works well not the first year but the consecutive years it does i do i alleviate the pressure of kind of having to give myself a lot of lectures for the students i record it ahead of time that's when i have to put in more work um, but then once I upload it on Kaltura and I have the link, I know I will have it for the next few years. I know at some point I'll have to redo it. But if I do that, then I, I can send the students, okay, there is a quiz there, you'll have to complete it. And there is the lecture, it's already uploaded. So it kind of frees the time to do kind of slightly more playful things in the classroom. Um, and I think it tends to work. I don't have to worry about that. Um, I know it's always difficult, um, but I try to escape from the linear thing of being the lecturer and the students at the other side receiving everything. Um, what I find the most challenging too is that telling the students, okay, put your phones down, you know, and listen. 
right? Sometimes they 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 say yes, but they are you can see that they are hiding their phones and I don't know if they are TikToking or whatever they are doing, but that's very distracting and um, that's a huge challenge. We I don't think I have an answer on that yet. <laughs> I think a lot of what we've been doing does help mitigate that to a certain extent. If they're interested, they will put down their phones. And Manish wants to add something here. Yes, Theo. So for your question four, so um, I believe like if we want to spend less time uh, with some effective content, I think the Center for Career Development is a wonderful resource. I believe we have yeah. some ready career content module so the faculty members can actually make use of those mm -hmm. so that's a wonderful resource curated by the uh, staff members in ccd i think that could be a great resource for someone who would like to incorporate career content in their course sorry i i, I missed it <laughs> no worries and that no would worries. be a, that would be that would be an injustice to you folks if i do not talk about that. No, thank you so much, Manish. Yeah, yeah let's, let's, there is more yeah. than one module there. Yeah, there is mm -hmm. one more than it's. They are fully developed, um, and once you start diving in, you see rubrics that you can import, mm -hmm. lectures, all kinds of things, and mm -hmm. everything. When you import it, you need to send them an email, and they'll, um, and then you'll have that in your in your e course, and then it's up to you to to make. Um, available to the students only the portions that you want. Um, it feels a bit intimidating because it's very well developed, you know, the modules there, but you don't have to accept them all. You know, the major mo module, you can just pick the parts that you want. Um, so that's another advantage, but it's, and I understand they are wanting to, there are more modules in, pro in progress, right? That haven't been shared with the, with the faculty yet. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for that, gentlemen. Uh, let's just uh, turn our focus back to the students. So from your experience, what has been the reaction of the students to you incorporating career content within the curriculum? Has there been something that has surprised you? And um, let's start with Manish this time around. Yeah, so I will start with uh, the first year class, Engineering 1166. So the first time I told them that I am planning to bring one of my upper level students to the class and they would like to talk about fundamentals of engineering exam. And the classroom was silent and like with poker faces all around. So I didn't even, I couldn't gauge whether they really want it or not. And, but I went with it anyway and during that presentation, so it was supposed to be a 10 minute presentation, but we went, I think for 20 minutes and that student and me as well, we received so many questions from the first year students, like so many questions. So it was a huge success. So I would say, I'm glad that I decided to go with it anyway. And for senior design, I mean, they are senior students, so I, I would assume they are more mature, they are actually. But when I talk about, okay, you have to give an interview, you have to submit a cover letter. Sometimes I, I get not so positive responses from some students. Some students consider that to be okay. This is another component of the course. If they finish it, they will get the grades. So yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges for me to uh, explain beforehand that, okay, why we are doing so. So that would be my uh, takeaway point that if we can explain what we are doing and why we are doing, I think uh, the students understand because they know what uh, that we are trying to help them with their career or career choices. So that would be my takeaway that we can explain it better. Yeah. Thank you, Manish. Jorge? Yeah, well, um, as we, um, sometimes students, some of them have a very clear idea of what would be their goals professionally, but the majority, I would say, they do not know. They vaguely know what they like and dislike, um, 
So one thing that I have always told the students is that take as many internships as possible. And even if they took one that they did not like at all, well, that's already an answer, all right? You thought you would become, I don't know, an automotive engine, uh, designer or engineer, and you, through that internship, you find out that it's actually not your field. You didn't like it at all. Well, okay, that's actually a positive. There's always a positive on things. So the students that have had some professional work, whether it is in the field or not, they are already at an advantage because they know already uh, how to deal with people. They know what are some sort of responsibilities that they have to meet. Um, but um, the advice that I give them when they are looking for, for, for goals, for career options, would be first that they do their own exploration. Mm -hmm. Go to the popular um, job sites and do a preliminary search. And then in other classes that I have taught, I told them not only to do that, but also bring it printed out to class. And we use a, a whole wall and then the same thing that I did with the post-its, we try to figure them out in, in categories and we kind of put them in columns and then we try to see how this big field um, can be breaking down into subcategories. And then I tell them to look and find websites um, of, of uh, people that have done professional portfolios to seek employment. And I tell them, well, obviously I sound old, but um, of course you're gonna be like, oh, here we go again, it's just like my parents. Yeah, when there was no internet, you know, finding professional portfolios of fellow colleagues that were graduating and were showing their work, you were lucky if you could see one or two. You would have to go to, inter to, to um, professional agencies that would seek um, employment for you. And maybe they had one or two examples, but it was this whole mystery. Right now, it's actually the opposite. They have too many examples. And I tell them to bring two or three printed out in color to class. And then we discuss what they liked, what they didn't like. And they kind of start to figure out how well they are prepared as they compare themselves with basically the rest of the world. Um, and I tell them too, well, basically, guys, you know, you are at the four. Um, you're the front runners here. At some point, I will retire. I will not be a teacher anymore. And you guys will carry the brunt of the profession. You are going to invent it, whether it remains the same or develops into something new that we don't know about, you'll figure it. So sometimes I tell them the jobs will be published and some other times they will be not published. You have to find them. There is, I don't know, maybe Nancy has that percentage, but there is a certain percentage of jobs that don't even hit the level of being advertised. When I tell them, you also need to find those. Um, people, employers often don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they are missing this. They want this professional in this field. You have to make yourself available to them. And... Um, that links to something else. They need to learn early on. And this becomes um, something personal. Some students accept rejection well, some others don't. So you need, I need to tell them early, and I should probably mention that more often in my classes. Hey guys, it's okay to say no, but if you didn't start early on, you know, playing this game, you will never gain experience. At some point, somebody will open the door slightly and that's your chance. Um, but be ready to be rejected a bunch of times. Um, yeah, and the difference is, we should say that in engineering, um, students have had certain, in the field of industrial design, unfortunately, you don't have to pass any certification. So the competition is stiffer in the sense that anybody can claim to be a designer. Right, so you can have, there is very few people that are very good that never went to college, and then there's other people that went to college, but everybody's in the same pool. So I tell them it's even more reason to have a good um, narrative of what is your work and how you need to present it to the whole world, what you're doing. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jorge and Manish. Now we are a bit behind schedule, and I do want to leave some time for our uh, for our guests to ask you uh, what I'm sure are very uh, thought provoking questions. But uh, we do have two or three questions left, so let me just quickly move on to ask you whether you're you have been able to engage your students on career topics outside the classroom whether it's through one-on-one -on -one mentoring or of some other way and Manish would you like to go first yes I do interact with students um, outside the classroom regarding their career so as I mentioned before that in school of engineering advising is mandatory so I get uh, I get first year, second year students as well, but normally the faculty members get juniors and seniors. So what I do is, and and we, it's a mandatory that the students meet with us every semester for their course selection for the following semester. So mm -hmm. I actually take advantage of that session because I know the student, the advisees will have to come to me. If unless I sign out a paper, they won't be able to register for the following semester. So I take that opportunity. So I send an email to my advisees early that, okay, please uh, schedule an appointment with me for the advising session. And please come prepared with a list of courses that you would like to take so that I spend less time on the course selection and the remaining time I actually spend talking mm -hmm. about the career. I also give them a heads up so that they don't get surprised uh, in the meeting that I would like to talk about uh, career related stuff if you are willing to do so and then i start talking about how to uh, how sh they should prepare for the for the job application process or if someone has an ensuing interview how would they go about the interview and also i try to um, try to direct them to the various resources uh, at ccd i tell them that you folks have you know mock interview session and resume and cover letter critic session. So I try to direct them to uh, those events as well. And also I, the emails that I got from, C I get from CCD regarding different events. And I know the students also get those. So I don't normally forward all the emails, but if I see something that is very interesting, I feel mm -hmm. like that will help my advisees, my students. So I also forward those emails to them sometimes to us to some specific students where i know what they want what their needs are and i also ask like i also do uh, offer my students or advises uh, some uh, chances where they can get their application materials critiqued by them I, I give them feedback i give them my comments and they don't have to be uh, my advice in that respect. I mean, okay. yeah, any student can come. That's what I try to tell them. That's wonderful, Manish. Jorge, what about you? Yeah, um, well, outside the classroom, um, now that we are returning, I hate to say this, but through the COVID times, we didn't have the opportunity to meet students in the hallways or staying a few minutes after class. Uh, but sometimes those few minutes are quite precious. Even if we have to stop the class five minutes early, I don't think it's time wasted because then there are these few students that want to stay a little bit longer and they have a question maybe related to the class, but some of the times, you know, beyond. And that would, that's when the career sometimes would happen. Um, and we can just direct them in many ways, but I think it's important to give them the opportunity to stop by not even doing office hours, but in those few minutes to, to chat. Um, also, I think it's important to remind them that we are here for them and that um, we're always happy on a limited basis, of course, because they need they lose the, the value. We are here to write letters of recommendation for those who earned it. So I always tell them, don't forget that you're very happy to be done with this class, but if you did a good job, I'll be happy to write that. And I know, we all know that students will request it one, two days or five hours before a particular deadline. So I would advise faculty to have 
a few templates ready if you don't have those ready. And not that we would have to change a few words, but if in the, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, if you have to write something, at least you can jumpstart your process and then erase the whole thing and then write your own. But I think it's very important to, to give the students that opportunity to say, hey, during class, I valued your time. You did a phenomenal job. Let me help you push a little bit more. And then the last thing, of course, if I hear of somebody looking for a job and it's sometimes when they call me employers and, hey, I, um, I would pass it to the career center, but some other times it's so hot that it's burning. It's a hot potato in the hand. Who do we know? And then I don't be shy of the faculty, talk to other faculty members and find your resources so that that potential job lands in the right hand. Um, yeah, because he might be gone the day after or in two days. So this is kind of, we have to develop also these, these connections so that the students will get the benefit at the end. Yeah. That's a very important point. Second to last question, uh, you, you both are career champions. So uh, I want you to tell the audience what it is that prompted you to become a career champion and how have you benefited as a result? of being a career champion. Uh, Jorge, you can start. Yeah, super easy. Just, uh, I always had this, that interest. Um, I always wanted the students to show them, you know, that door. So to me, it was just a natural transition. I started when I joined UConn, I started seeing these emails like, hey, yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in. This is kind of natural uh, for me. Um, because it was basically a continuation of what I had been doing. But the difference is really the 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 um, you can has really a good system in place, and I was happy to be that. It was not just me doing these things on the side or kind of secretly. There was a whole network of other student, uh, other faculty interested in the same topic, and with the right um, support behind us, that made a big difference for sure. Thank you, Manish. Yeah, for me, I would say. There were two reasons for me to join the career champion program. One was very personal because I was a grad student at UConn, a PhD student, and I was a direct beneficiary of CCD. So I just wanted to pass it along. And with I, I got a lot of help from CCD and especially Kay Gruder. She mm -hmm. was, she is a wonderful career coach and I, I received a lot of help from her. So I just thought, okay, now I should uh, pay back. And the second was, I remember a discussion with Nancy where she told me that, you know, Manish, we have career consultant, professional advisors and whatnot, but the students, uh, they also prefer to talk to a faculty member uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to their career related stuff. And that's how, she sold it. So I became a career champion and I'm very happy to do this. Thank you so much both for your endorsement. Here's my last question before we turn it over to the audience. And I just want a quick 30 second answer from each uh, in the interest of time. Now through this discussion, uh, it's, it's, it's apparent how your students have benefited from you incorporating career content within your curriculum. What's potentially less apparent is how you as faculty members have benefited from this. So what is the ROI at the end of the day? Has the way that, for example, have your, are your students now viewing your content in a different way? Have they, their level of engagement in the classroom changed? What have you observed? Uh, Jorge, let's start with Jorge this time. Um, yeah, well, um, I think the, the, that ROI is kind of an elusive um, term because quite often it's not quantifiable. Um, obviously, there is very this very few times when the students actually are successful finding these jobs and they share with you, you know, oh, this is how much I'm making. Well, okay, that's one way of seeing that. But I think it's more, in my case, it's more like the personal satisfaction of having helped students. But it comes at a trickle, sometimes years. Um, after this has happened uh, and, and you reconnect them through LinkedIn or something else, but it, it's a long game. Um, so sometimes, well, 
I don't expect really anything beyond, you know, just having the satisfaction of helping students. And then obviously when I, when I go through the reappointment, it's another line, a wonderful line to add. Um, the capability of kind of reaching beyond just what I, of my specialty and, and giving back to the community for sure. Okay, thank you. Manish? Yeah, for me, yeah, definitely the satisfaction uh, because if a student writes to me, okay, Dr. Roy, thank you for introducing me to FE exam. I took that exam last week and I passed. So that's the biggest satisfaction I can get. And the other one is when I interact with students and I also learn a lot of stuff from them, like what they need and what are sometimes they actually tell me, okay, you know what? You can talk about these resources to your other students. So I think that's my return of investment that I learn from them and that learning I can further disseminate to the next batch of students or advices. Okay. Manish and Jorge, thank you so much for all these incredible insights and advice and recommendations. So I think it will be a, a, a time for us now to see if there are any questions from the audience for uh, our two uh, panel speakers. Checking the chat. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, Manish, you had mentioned um, senior design and that you have career focused content within your senior design um, class. Is that, and I know senior design is run by discipline or by major. So is that just what you have or is there like a standard senior design within engineering and um, people can see, you know, so I'm just wondering if some of the others who are doing senior design in their majors also have access to those modules and that content you were talking about. No, Nancy, the modules that I, the module that I talked about that was very particular to civil and environmental engineering students. So uh, as I mentioned that, the summer of 2020, we curated those resources for the students with the help of uh, graduate, some graduate TAs. And those uh, contents are only accessible to the particular year. Okay, so if there are other faculty who oversee senior design and they wanted yeah. to, to model something, they could, they could reach out to you. Yes, should okay. be, yeah. I mean, I'm not the sole owner of that module, uh, but yes, they can reach out yeah. to us and yeah. Okay. We do have a question in the chat. Do students ever seem to convey that senior design is too late to talk about cover letters and resumes? I tried some of this last year and they really wanted this uh, content much earlier. Your comments? Yes, I can take a stab at that. Definitely, mm -hmm. that's the wonderful question and it's so true. I actually received uh, some feedback from my students that uh, why can't we have this early on in our uh, Yukon career or Yukon, uh, you know, student life. And same goes with FE exam. The, 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 the grad student that I was referring to, actually he offered me that uh, presentation, that he would do the presentation in my class. And he told me that uh, he, is a first gen student. And when he took 1166 and he didn't know about FE exam. So he told me, Dr. Roy, I was, I wish I knew about FE exam a lot early than our fourth year senior design course. So yes, definitely. I do get feedback mm -hmm. that it's too late. If I might quickly jump in here, because we had a, the recent experience of electric boat coming on campus to interview for various engineering uh, disciplines, basically, that were here for three days. And we had the same issue where students hadn't included their uh, senior design experience, their resumes, because it wasn't completed. But while discussing this with the employer after the interviews, they said it would, would have been perfectly OK had they included it in the resumes, included it in the cover letter, and just said ongoing. It's something to be completed. There's nothing wrong with doing that. So if that's something that you can share with your students too, it might the timing might not be ideal, but if there's nothing stopping them from saying that it's something they're, they're, being, they're currently engaged in. 
Yes, Theo. I actually, what I tell my advice is that, I mean, if you can mention the 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 chronology, I mean, we do it anti chronologically. But if you if they mention the timeline, for example, if they are doing a project which is ongoing, so they can give a start date and then hyphen present, right? That means it's mm -hmm. ongoing anyway. Yes. Okay. Thank they you. should absolutely talk about this, but I get so many calls from the prospective employers. Okay, this student uh, put your name as a reference and mm -hmm. they are doing a senior design project with you. Can you tell about those students? So yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. And I do have a quick question for Jorge because the truth is that you as faculty members sometimes uh, know about potential experiential learning or, or job opportunities out there that are associated with your area of expertise that we as career advisors do not. And I remember Jorge telling us a couple of weeks ago that you uh, uh, encourage your students to explore other opportunities. Can you talk about those opportunities you mentioned in our conversation? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that conversation was about sometimes students. Well, it, it went to that conversation went into two separate areas. First, they as they go about and do their own searches, sometimes they don't. Um, they look into the professional field, but they need to know that there is sort of two other fields. Some of them they never even thought about, and that is public service, whether it is for local governments. Um, municipalities even or for the federal government. Uh, there are all kinds of agencies that actually would like to receive you know, good candidates and they, their, their pay is competitive and they have also great benefits. And also this other third leg, which is the nonprofit organizations in this country, they hold a lot of um, power in terms of employment. I know it's seen sometimes as you know, this broken leg that they, are, they underpay, well, many of them you'll be surprised, not anymore, um, and they want really good professionals. So sometimes it's just that opening, eye-opening experience, like, hey guys, did you consider this? Well, did you ever guys go to the federal government agency? You know, there is a website where you can just log in and have your information there. It will take you one or two days. Once you have all that information in, you have, these wonderful resources for potential jobs. Um, and I tell them, yes, even the military, even with the electric boat, right? And sometimes I tell them, well, employers um, are the only ones that would vet you to get into some sort of, uh, there are different levels of secrecy in the government, I guess, when you handle some classified information. And through employment with them, they'll get the clearance, the students will get, well, the, prof the young professionals will get that clearance that then they can take for another job. And they're like, oh, so I cannot apply for it myself. No, it has to be done through um, a federal, uh, for a job, with a job. Oh, okay, that's interesting, right? Yeah, so, and we're getting some comments there as well, with security clearances like hold in DC, exactly, it, gold. Yes. That's exactly right. And then suddenly students are like, oh, that's a whole new area I didn't think about. But some of the times students find opportunities that we teachers don't, well, never thought about. Um, so the, the, the learning goes both ways. And some of the times we teachers have to steer students because they are looking in the wrong areas. So we are kind of guiding them a little bit. No, this is these YouTube things that you're watching, it's not exactly what it is, right? It's the wrong area, the wrong thing. So it goes both ways. Sometimes they they find gold and some other times, you know, they don't. And we need to mm -hmm. get them in a different direction. Okay, thank you so much, Rogel. Uh, it's already it's 201. So I think unless we have any, uh, the last question, I can turn it over to Nancy. Great, thank you so much, Theo and uh, Jorge and Manish. Um, this was a great information that you shared and um, thanks everyone for attending and participating and we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you all again next semester. Thank so. you all. Thank you, Manish. Thank, thank you. Care. Take care, thank you.